together and help me welcome Miss Katie Ross. Hello everyone, welcome to Life After Full Sail. It is so nice to have you with us. And I think the thing I wanna tap into as we start well. and before I tap into the brilliance of this amazing panel is really just honoring the fact that you're all here and have created space to thinking about what life should look like after Full Sail and what are those things that you can do now as a student, whether you're graduating in the next graduation or if you just started as a new student and you're still a few years away from graduating, just being open to the idea of the things that you can do now to really control what that future can look like for you. So I do have to say, as I was doing research on all of you last week and just kind of looking at your backgrounds, I've noticed that all of you have a, again, vast experience in your field. You've all have kind of taken different paths that sometimes too, maybe even changed fields and dived into different areas. Also, when, some, when many of you had graduated too, uh, I would even say some of your fields weren't even as connected as they are now through the use of technology. And I think that's another thing to really hold on to today is that technology is changing the way that we are working together. And so when we're thinking about life after full cell and what that looks like is being open to how you can be moving into a future that's, or into an industry that maybe hasn't even been developed yet that many of you might develop to. So the first question for the panel today is really focused on the classroom environment. And I'd like to hear from all of you on, you know, what are some of the components or the moments that you are in the classroom learning that you think prepared you to be confident enough after graduation to put that resume out there and, and start trying to move into your industry? Brian. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the opportunities that was given uh, while here, um, similar to this, where we had the opportunity to see and to interact with industry professionals um, really helped me. Um, uh, I think it's what led to my first job, actually. I met the person who hired me uh, right here at an event. So um, for me, uh, I think that was the biggest thing, was taking advantage of the, uh, what I like to call the extra opportunities, because they weren't necessarily in the classroom, but uh, the extra opportunities like this to visit and to meet with industry professionals. Yeah, I'd, I'd say um, I agree with a lot of that. I think, you know, the stuff you do in the classroom and the stuff you do in labs, like that's table stakes for showing up, right? Like everybody that's here is gonna go through that stuff. So you have to think about like, what are the opportunities I have to differentiate or learn a little more or put a little more into it to get a little more out of it? Full Sail is a really special place. It's kind of this Petri dish of like super passionate people that uh, really care about the stuff that you care about and they will take it as seriously as you take it. And every little ounce that you give into Full Sail, you will get back in spades. And so for me, when I think about my time at Full Sail, I actually don't remember that much about some like being in classes or being in a lab. The moments I remember are like, oh wow, all these renders messed up and now I have to troubleshoot it and fix it. Or, oh, we got a little extra screen uh, green screen time from Macrotan, like let's, let's stay in late and just play with the camera a little bit. Like those are the things I remember and those are the things that you take with you into professional experiences because that's what happens in real life, right? Like the renders crash. <laughs> uh, and so getting through as much of that now as you can sort of prepares you for those dynamic environments in the professional field. Yeah, I mean, I'd say for me, <clears throat> just piggybacking on these two guys, I think one of the things that, that panned out really well after I left school was, for my program in animation, was just how much they taught us over the whole swatch of animation and not just one specific thing. Um, and at the time, I really didn't grasp how that might play out later. But when I left, it kind of opened the doors to a lot of different jobs I could do when I left. And to this day, I'm still glad that I took all these other things, even though I'm doing animation, I still work with all those other departments and I'm in a position where I can talk to them because I know all of their jobs. Um, the other thing I took from this is being at the school specifically on campus was it gave me an opportunity to work on my networking skills and kind of take those to the ne next level and kind of see how that was going to transition into my field when I actually had a network once I left school. That was, that was huge for me actually. What are some of the things that you think that you did during your downtime between classes that allowed you to get those extra skills and knowledge to prepare you? Can you think of any specific things that you did? Yeah, I mean, I, I spent, um, so I did digital art and design when I was doing web design, motion graphics, visual effects, but my background's in skateboarding and filming skateboarding. 
And I would say the majority, a huge portion of what led to my future career is me shooting the skateboarding that was what I was excited about outside of class. So I would go home, you know, any chance I got, and I would or film friends in Orlando at skate parks, whatever, and film the skate stuff, and then I would bring it back to class. And then I would sit with teachers like Matt Crutan, who's a teacher I had, who's actually the reason that I got a job in Los Angeles. And a huge part of it is because I would do stuff outside of class that would get him excited. Because again, it's like, oh yeah, you're supposed to do these projects. But what really excites teachers and the teachers who are ultimately the professionals and the people that are like who you're going to deal with in the future, that's your first interaction with what your like, rest of your life is going to be. Yeah, I, I think I was really lucky with, with animation. There's so much stuff online. Um, with my peers, we would go home and look at Facebook and join these like CG groups. There's so many people willing to share. And so we would just look at stuff that would get us excited and people that were creating awesome things and um, having a buddy that was a tech artist was like, oh, I'm going to rig it. And I'm like, great, I'm going to animate it. And just getting those interactions in early allowed me, once I got out in the industry, it felt like second nature to go and interact with these people, so. Yeah, for me, uh, I mean, very similar in the sense of any time I was outside of class, all I wanted to do was create my own artwork based off of the things I was learning in class. And so, you know, very early on, I started making short films and doing faux title sequences, like just exploring what was possible. And that got me fired up about the stuff. And then eventually those personal projects ended up opening the door for me to enter into the industry. So, yeah. Yeah, that's really powerful too because while you were in your free time and working on these passion projects, you were using the knowledge you gained from your classes to give you the ability to do it. And also doing it in a low stakes environment, right? Like there's no grade attached to it or anything along those lines. You can do whatever you wanted and bring it back to your teachers for that feedback. Yeah, so, that's right. Excellent. Yeah, your, your ability to experiment right now is so important because it's, you know, you want to do the best job you can, but at the end of the day, it's low stakes, and this is like the time of your life. I mean, you should never stop experimenting and, and learning and growing, but man, I don't think anyone here would disagree that like experiment, <laughs> get sloppy, because it's, you know, it's low stakes now, but it will you know, possibly build a huge part of your future. Yeah, I was gonna say, mistakes now don't get you fired. So go ahead and make them all now. <laughs> Um, definitely, I think it also, that whole, you know, not being afraid to make a mistake is great to get instilled, you know, in, into yourself right now to do that experiment. I mean, there's still downtime even after you leave here. There's going to be downtime maybe at a studio or maybe you have some off time somewhere else to try out new things. There's always new equipment coming up that you need some off, you know, off stress time to, to go through that. So it's good to get into that mode now where you can find those moments to try different things and to try new things. Because gear and equipment and software is constantly evolving. So it, it's, a, it's a definite rat race just trying to keep up with it at times. But it's good to instill, uh, instill those habits here at school. Absolutely. So what are some of the behaviors you think that students can work on now to prepare themselves to be a graduate and to, you know, again, this is for the new student who's just walking across the stage and getting ready to go out into the industry. What are those behaviors that are important? Uh, I, I think one, it sounds very elementary, but, you know, play well with others uh, because you're almost, uh, I mean, I'm trying to think of any degree offered here that you would not be working as part of a team. So you're always going to be working uh, with someone else. And no matter what degree program you're in here, we're, we're all in the service industry. Uh, you know, we're, we're making something for someone else or we're helping to develop someone else's idea. So to definitely, you know, learn to, to take the creative, uh, you know, criticism at times, uh, you know, how to, how to read people and understand what, what they want. Because, uh, you know, sometimes they don't, they just don't know the words, the client may not know the words to tell you technically what you need to do. So it's good to do that interaction and to work with the team and to see how that works with the team. You find strengths in people, you find weaknesses in people. And it's not necessarily that it's a weakness, it's just you know what not to give them and what things they are good at. And uh, I definitely would start that now. Yeah, I think there's, 
you know, there, there's like so many pieces of advice, but if I had to think of like one very pragmatic thing that you could start doing today, it's that um, one of the differences between a brand new designer and like a senior designer that's been doing it for a while is their approach to receiving feedback. And it's really hard when you're in school to understand what feedback means and how you can use feedback. And I'm talking about feedback on, on work specifically. When somebody's giving you feedback on work, it is an opportunity. It, is, it has nothing to do with your like personal taste. It has nothing to do oftentimes also with your execution. It's about like, is this thing that I created objectively solving the question or the problem that, that was like given to me? And when somebody gives you feedback, like one of your instructors or peers, like take it to heart. Think, what can I learn from that? Like, there's this reaction, this visceral reaction that we have that you just have to get past of taking that personally. And it is, uh, it is never personal other than making you personally better. Uh, so learn to take it, learn to pivot from it. Uh, and the faster you can internalize that, the faster you'll grow, because that's how you learn. Yeah, I was thinking like working on your problem solving skills, right? Because I think for all of us, like the beginning of a project is there's this problem that we need to solve, whether it's for a client, for ourselves, for a project. And I think flexing that kind of creative thinking muscle is super important because like you said, the tools change and it's hard to keep up with that stuff sometimes. But like if you can get your mind in a place to where just right off the cuff, you know what to do, or at least get there pretty quickly, that's super valuable. Yeah, when you pay it, I mean, sure, we all are. We hear a lot about industries asking for that soft skill, and it's exactly, it's teamwork, it's collaboration that industries are asking for right now and who they're gonna be hiring. It is problem-solving skills. It is being able to take and accept feedback, and that is something that we work on a lot in our general education courses and also throughout all of our courses as well. And again, it's a low-stake environment because you can't get fired, <laughs> which, is always, which is always a plus. So, what should grads expect once they graduate? I think sometimes we, uh, we get to meet people like you and we get to see you right now, right, where you're in these fabulous jobs, doing a lot of fun things, changing the way that we are taking in entertainment. But I have a feeling it didn't look like that for you once you actually left Full Sail. So tell us a little bit about what real life was for you when you graduated, when you moved out to try to get that first job. I Okay. Well, <laughs> I can guarantee they're all sad stories. So, Brett, by all means, start it off. Can you get some tissues, please? I, uh, yeah, I mean, I had a, a weird kind of journey. I actually got offered a job um, straight off the bat from uh, at Full Sail, like right before I graduated. I, I met with Cully Bunker, if you guys know uh, Cully Bunker, visual effects artist, um, through a teacher, Matt Rutan. But long story short, I was offered a job, came out to LA, and I spent the first several years pretty quickly having it like perfect where I was working as a VFX supervisor and it was like everything bragging rights. And then only a few years in, I just kind of came, like I was so burnt out. I didn't know what I was actually wanting anymore. I got thrown on jury duty for a month and a half. And in that month and a half, I quit my job. Like went outside for lunch and I was like, this is what the sun is like. I've never been outside in California. Um, and I quit my job. I had no backup, no nothing. And that was, it was kind of like, I left college with, you know, having it where nobody has it that way, where it's like, you got your job and everything's perfect and you're a supervisor. And then I was like, oh, I don't want it anymore. And I quit. And then I started my like normal journey of like, oh, how do I pay rent? What do I want to do with my life? How do I want to move forward? And I fell into directing and skateboarding, what was my original passion. And I've been doing that for 10 years and been pretty successful at it. I will say this though. Most of us have a pretty wacky story, and most of it is rarely just like, well, I just handed in the resume and everything worked out in the long run. A lot of us have some strange story that involves, like, I met some person at a coffee shop three years later after I thought I was about to be evicted from my house. Um, and so I usually use that as advice to tell people that when you feel, when you're at a point where you're, like, broken, be patient. Because most of us, it's always that thing around the corner, and you never know what that thing around the corner is, as long as you're open to opportunity. Um, usually that's how the story goes, I find. Geckler now with the sad story. Yeah, I uh, didn't have that. <laughs> <laughs> that was way better uh, than mine. No, I, um, I, I think the reality was that you, you graduate and you were all in the same boat. You're applying to a lot of places. And for me, uh, I, I was more hedging bets. And I realized for what I wanted to do at some point, 
um, Los Angeles was going to be the best bet for me to be local because I, I had researched and I realized they probably weren't going to fly out a kid with zero experience and wine and dine them to come into their studio. So my thought was, well, look, I'll be there. So if they need somebody right away, I can just drive down the road and I'm here in your face. Um, and that worked in the sense of four months of sleeping on a friend's couch in North Hollywood in his one bedroom, sharing one bathroom. Um, I finally got the opportunity, um, but it took getting up at 5.30 every day, applying until 5.30 at night when I thought the HR lady went home at the studio, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, while cleaning this guy's apartment because I felt so bad to be on his couch. Um, for me, though, there was just this underlying driving motivation that I just didn't want to fail not just for my family, not just for my friends, but it was just an, an inner driving thing that I can't, like, I just can't fail. Like, I went to school for this. I, 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 just, I couldn't accept that it wasn't going to work out. No matter how long that took that to happen, like, I, I just, I kept pushing that to kind of make it happen. Um, and I think that's something you need to leave the school with, regardless of where you go or what you do. If you lose that, I can assure you, you'll start doing this real fast. So I would say anything is, when you leave here, whatever motivation that had you come to this school, round two, as soon as you leave school, because it's going to start all over again. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't really have an A plan, a B plan. I had a plan. Uh, <laughs> there was no B plan. <clears throat> I didn't want to think about a B plan. So uh, I just, like Jack said, I just kept moving into what I wanted to do. Um, you know, uh, maybe my parents didn't think that was a great plan, but seems to have worked out so far. But, um, you know, you just have to just, you know, what, what do you want to see? What do you want to set your eyes on? And, you know, you may see where you want to be at the top of the mountain, but, you know, you can't exactly navigate from sitting at the bottom. You, there may be some turns and there may be some cliffs and there may be some hard hills. You know, and you may have to take, you know, go left for a little bit before, and then steer back right to get on the path. But it's all part of the path. And I think just leaving your mind open to... Uh, in, in, into that way of thinking. For me, I wanted to be in live productions. Uh, particularly, I wanted to be in the lighting. So, but if I couldn't get a job lighting, I would take a job doing curtains. I would take a job, I took a job as a floral assistant one time, but I did whatever I could to work around the people that I wanted to be around. And that's the approach that I took. Yeah, I think you, you want to be attached to a dream, not a plan. Um, because the plan never goes the way you thought. Um, during uh, school, we made a list of like the top places that we wanted to work, and one of the places that was on my list was this um, interactive studio in Chicago. And the week before graduation, I came home uh, here in Orlando, and there was a message on my machine. I had never even reached out to this company. There was a message on my machine from the company, and they're like, oh, we saw your work somewhere, and uh, you know, we want to talk. Got on the phone with them. They were basically like, yeah, there's a job for you here. Like, come on, it's going to be great. So I was like, awesome. Turned down a couple offers down here in Florida, moved back to the Midwest, went to Chicago. The entire thing fell through. So now I was like, OK, I went from having like three job offers to no job offers. And uh, so you know, I moved back home for a little stint in Iowa. My roommate from Full Sail called, said, uh, what are you doing right now? Said, oh, man, I'm just sitting around <laughs> uh, figuring out what's next. And he's like, you want to move to California? I said, let's do it. So we got in the car, no job, no apartment lined up, uh, just a couple garbage bags of clothes on my computer. We found, uh, stayed in a hotel for like a week, found an apartment, just sending out show reels, sending out links, sending out DVDs, uh, and eventually some stuff landed. Uh, started doing uh, motion graphics, then I got an offer at Warner Brothers to do interactive, and it was just because like, it just kept going. Like, you know, I think you said it, like, you can't accept no. <laughs> right? Like for yourself. Uh, you just set the vision and set the dream and then like the path doesn't even matter as much. You just have to get there and you just keep going. Yeah, for me, I was wanting to stay here local in Florida when I graduated. So EA was like the dream um, and I'd applied a couple of times and didn't get in. So I, I realized I was going to have to go out and get experience and um, my wife was here. So we made like a two year plan of just get as much experience as you can. Just you know, go out and do it. You have to. So I went out to California. I, I got the chance to work um, on The Sims and then got into motion capture and um, got really homesick and came back here and 
was like, I, I have to get into this company. So I actually got in in QA. Um, and it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do, but I got to meet a ton of people. And um, after that was over, I went back to California to keep getting my experience up. And um, I actually got a phone call from my manager in QA. And she said, hey, I saw this animation position open up. And I thought of you. And gave me the internal reference. And sure enough, here I am. So. It, it really is if there's, you can go you know, forward, backward, sideways, but if, if you have an idea of what you want and you're willing to do whatever you have to to get to it, you, you can. You just have to be willing to be uh, determined to do it. Yeah, I, I learned the, uh, the power of pivoting real quickly <laughs> in my career. I mean, I, I graduated and had my dream internship set up. I left the day after school and moved to LA and thought like, this is gonna be amazing. Like all the goofy, silly nights I had with like my fellow classmates, like this is just gonna continue. And I got into my internship and quickly realized that wasn't true. <laughs> it took me like three months and I was like, that's it, I'm out. I don't necessarily recommend that. You're burning a bridge. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I, I left my internship three months early and um, kind of like everyone else here, it sounds like I, I just, I said yes to an opportunity that came up and one step after another, I quickly began to realize what I actually liked doing, and that's where I found fun. And that's kind of what led me to where I am at now. So one of the things that I think, you, again, you kind of all have mentioned is you, you graduate, you're ready, and you start putting your resume out there all over the place. And it's not uncommon that we do here where people don't receive any information back. They don't get a a call back or an email. So what are some things, what's advice that you would give students that they can do if, if they're sitting in that spot after graduation? They're putting the resume out, not hearing anything. What should they do? Can they, what wacky things should they do or, or any advice that you have? I would say while you're waiting, do things that are for you. So I can't, these guys would probably speak better to the actual company aspects. But uh, if you've got downtime, use that time to work on your art that makes you happy. Because most of the time, that's the art that's going to be the best in a lot of respects. And that's ultimately what will help you in the career aspect anyways. Like, I got my job out of school because I was shooting the stuff that was close to my heart. And that was much better than any of the regular class projects I did. And ultimately, the things that were close to my heart became my career. And so, you know, maybe that won't specifically happen, but it's kind of a win-win because at least you get to hang out and do whatever you want. As far as your art, like you like to paint, cool paint. If you make a living do it, great. If not, you still get to paint. Win-win. <laughs> I think I think that downtime, there's a win there's certainly a window of time for self-evaluation, and I think that's a hard thing to do or to even teach ourselves that I've sent all these out, I'm getting no input, and instead of maybe coming up with just one reason why that's happening, actually taking some time to not just get feedback from other people, but really look at yourself and your work and go, okay, maybe why is this not happening for me? Um, and I know I had moments of that to be like, okay, wh where's my shortcomings in what I'm doing? And is this my time right now to kind of step up what I'm doing? Because it turns out you have nothing but time potentially to actually step your game up. Um, and I've seen it happen on a lot of students. They've left and all of a sudden they do. They create better work than they did even when they're at school. Um, so I'd say take some time, do some self-evaluation about what's happening um, without necessarily jumping to blame other people or anything else, what's going on. Look inside first and kind of go from there. Yeah, I, th I think you, know, you can actually look at it pretty objectively and think like, what does exceptional look like? And does exceptional look like sending off a resume and then sitting around waiting to hear back? Probably not. Um, exceptional might look like sending off a resume uh, because you want to be a character animator and in the meantime you go create an Instagram account and you post a new character animation thing every week and then you follow up with that person that you sent the resume to a few weeks later and you say hey I've been posting some of my work here I, I would love feedback on this specific animation um, do you have any tips those kinds of things are what stands out people are very busy a lot of times if you don't hear back it actually isn't anything personal um, people get a lot of emails people see a lot of resumes what can you do that's exceptional to make yourself stand out in a very pragmatic and execution uh, style fashion? Um, there, there's infinite opportunities, particularly with the way that like media disseminates across the internet today. Um, just do more. So 
if you were looking to hire someone, what are the things that you would be looking for? I'm looking for team player attributes. I'm looking for someone who can, you know, manage a task and try to get things done completed uh, at a, at a, on a certain time. I'm looking for someone who shows up on time, preferably early. Um, I'm looking for someone who's eager to, to see what's next. Um, I, I'm definitely interested in their, their tech savvy skills, but it's not the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth thing I'm looking at. Um, because I, uh, I, I love to teach. I feel like I can, I can teach people the, the technical stuff. Um, I can't teach people how to people skills, you know, you can suggest things. But for me, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for eagerness. I'm looking for someone who's, who's gonna have the heart and have the respect enough to show up to work on time. Uh, and I know it sounds extremely simple, um, but, it, but it is true, it goes, uh, it goes really far uh, in my industry for sure. Yeah. Just want to circle back with that to something Chris had mentioned too, because it's about that downtime, right? Like, so by creating that Instagram account, that's eagerness. By being involved in a community, whether it's a Facebook group with other people related to your industry, that's collaboration. So that's our kind of those other things that you can do during that downtime that really meet what Brian was saying. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's it's pretty simple. It's like attitude first, art second. Anything after that, I don't really care about. Like, like you be who you are, and you know, because because when it comes down to it, it's like if I'm gonna be stuck in a room with you for like you know x amount of hours, like we gotta have fun. Like we gotta be able to have small talk, you know, like secondhand. Like we gotta be able to laugh, and you have to be interested in kind of my world and what I'm going through. I I gotta be interested in you, and so I think it really comes down to just connection. Uh, that's that's the big thing for me is just making sure I connect with people that I work with Yeah, we at the studios I've been at we kind of talk all the time and it's kind of piggybacking off what Colin said because we were speaking earlier on this is that um, If your your resumes got to me and we're at the point of calling you for an interview We already know you can probably do the job and or like Brian said I can train you we're literally at this point just talking to you or bringing you in to see if you were somebody that we want to be around for potentially 10 to 12 hours a day. And, that, and honestly, and I think all of us can attest to that, at the end of the day, where I'm at in my career, it is much more important to be around people I like in what I do than me chasing a project I want to do. Matter of fact, it's probably everything to me at this point. One, one thing I would, I would point out uh, maybe a little adversely to that is, is that um, I think it's important that we tease out the difference between being somebody who is good to work with and being somebody with like a really bubbly social personality. I think if you are a little more on the introverted side or if you aren't, aren't so good at like, you know, kicking off little conversations and small talk with people, like that's okay. You can focus on the things that you're passionate about revolve your conversations around those things. Um, people can sense passion pretty clearly, especially people who have been doing it for a long time. And um, don't be discouraged uh, when you hear stuff like this because it's, it's actually, what we're saying is a little different uh, than what it might sound. It's not necessarily like be super personable, although you want some soft skills, right? right. Uh, work on your soft skills. Uh, they can be built. Um, but the important thing is that you care about people you're passionate about the work, and if that passion comes through when you talk, um, that goes a long way. Yeah, there's definitely a sense of, of what teamwork, like what a team literally means, and it's more attuned to the idea of a family. And it's not yeah, that everybody's right. personality matches, it's that we all kind of understand each other, and at the end of the day, you know, uh, love our existence enough around each other that we feel content about, you know, starting our days with you. Um, it's funny, the way you put it, the hours, I always think, I always say like, if I'm gonna be stuck in an edit bay for 90 hours with somebody, I want it to be somebody that, you know, is talented, but it's so far down the list from like somebody I can feel 
can empathize with what I'm doing, and then and then thus we give each other enough respect that we don't want to kill each other by the end of the day. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, you guys know your friends that you have your moments, but it's like you know the difference between that and like those same people that you can you can go to war with, and you want people that you feel comfortable and almost like joyous to go to war with, sort of speak. You can tackle the problem together. That's much more important than the person who's the most talented or the most skilled. You know, you all go to school with each other and you know the difference between somebody you want to pick in a group versus somebody who's the best in the class, but you kind of can't really handle being around for too long. Yeah, I mean, it's it, kind of what Chris is saying, just to come back to that, is that he's right. I, it actually, for me, is I'm actually okay with the introvert in the interview because in my head, knowing my personality, and I'm sure Chris is exactly the same way, I can pull it out of you. <laughs> I'm that guy. I can get you to talk to me. It's mostly in the interviews. I'm, the guys who scare us are the guys who are coming in with ego first, right. then it's their work. And I think we all can look up here. There's just, there's no place for that. And to me, I could care less how talented you are. If you're coming at it from this standpoint, that's, I, there's 10 other people who don't have that that I'd rather work with. I was scared to walk on stage until I met Jack. I was, I just, <laughs> <laughs> just, just one quick note onto that. In, in, the live, in the live industry, in the touring world, what I do, just to give some, some scope of what we're talking about of people to live with, I see the people on the road that I'm with, I see them more every year than I see my own family. So just to give an idea of where you're at with the people, and how you want someone you want to live with, it's pretty big, especially in the touring industry. I think too that introvert and extrovert, which again is something we hear uh, a lot about, is remembering that when you walk into an interview and you're meeting with someone or just networking with someone, to think about you're going up to someone who loves the same movies as you probably, or even if you don't like the same movies, you can at least talk about the technical components of that movie or the song. So you have the knowledge, again, from this time that you're spending in your classrooms now and learning and with your students that you can tap into those pieces of conversation to show those soft skills. It's not about being the social butterfly or the loudest person in the room or the person with the best projects. It's just about connection, and that's something we all know how to do, uh, just tapping into that love that you already know that you share. Because if you're being called in already, they already know that you have the skill. They just want to see that you can be part of that family. So now for students, okay, let's say, which is what's gonna happen to everyone watching this and in this room, you're gonna graduate, you're gonna get that job that you want. And how should students maybe go about kind of finding a mentor maybe at their company or wherever they're gonna work if they're a freelancer? How could they go about getting a mentor or even just leveling up their knowledge so that they can start to prepare for that next job? I think mentorship is huge. Um, I think when you, when you first leave here, the, the waters can be a bit murky at times, and you, you kind of want someone to, to talk some ideas through. Uh, I've been in the industry for 22 years. I still uh, call other people. I've called other Hall of Fame people, other people from school, just to bounce ideas off. You know, I've, um, you know, I was offered three tours today. Which one do I take? You know, things of that nature. Um, how to deal uh, and, and to interact with artists, an artist that may be possibly difficult. So you, I think you're constantly being mentored. Um, you definitely um, don't ever know all of it, but especially coming out, it's definitely encouraging to have someone that's been through the waters. As far as a way to find an, uh, a mentor, um, <clears throat> I know the placement department would be happily can put you in contact with any graduate that you may see could help you. And um, I know definitely speaking on the, the, the hall of, all the Hall of Fame members would gladly be able to, uh, wanting to assist a student in any way. So I do think the mentor and the mentoring ship is a very large component to succeeding uh, after full sale. I, I've always just tricked my mentors into being my mentors. <laughs> uh, like very early on, I reached out to a, a director at Pixar and just asked, can I ask you a couple questions? Like, I just started with that. I didn't, you know, fanboy, I didn't do any of that. I just started with that. And then I never stopped asking questions. Mm -hmm. And like, he's given me all kinds of great advice. And that's all I've done throughout my career is just, just ask, just ask people questions. I mean, there's nothing that says you can't just ask someone to mentor you. You know, you can just reach out and do that. 
And I think another thing to keep in mind is that it's not, well, everybody's experience is different. In my experience, it has never been like a formal thing. It's actually something that sort of happens very organically and magically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think with 18 years as a professional, I have what I would account to probably two professional mentors and one from my time here at Full Sail, Keith. And, uh, you know, I th all of those come together really organically. Like, you find somebody that you look up to and, and you ask some questions or you follow up for a little additional guidance. And then over time, you find that, you know, that line of communication stays open even if you move to different companies. And, you know, I I've had times like that. And in fact, I've had Full Sail students that have done that. You know, there, one person I met uh, five or six years ago, he followed up uh, after a Hall of Fame and we still talk every couple of months. And he asked questions of going in for this big interview. What do you think? What are they looking for? And you know, that's we never talked about having some mentorship structure. But you know, when I reflect on it, it's clearly what's happening. And that's just kind of how it goes. You know, um, you look for people that you respect and that their style resonates with you, and then you just try to emulate that and learn more. Sounds yeah. like you were tricked in a positive way. <laughs> I though. was. You, you tricked me. He's very. He's very clever. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I was really lucky, uh, all of us are lucky with the teachers we have. Um, first and foremost, that's kind of where I went back to was those uh, professors that I felt like I had great communication with and knew that they would give me good feedback and notes and as much advice as they could on what they knew in the industry. Um, also, we got Hall of Fame here, so you have all of these really awesome people. I know Jack's going to hate it, but when I was, when he was going into Hall of Fame, he actually looked at my reel. Um, and that's why it's so crazy for me to be here right now. But when you have these interactions with people and you're getting, you know, such great feedback and you can, you know, con continue to be okay with being critical of your own work and, and growing, um, it's, yeah, this is a great foundation to find, find a mentor and I feel like it just kind of uh, blossoms from there as you continue on. I'm, I met my, uh, my mentor while I was at school, my, prof my ultimately professional mentor while I was at school because he was doing a uh, video or a, some presentation for Adobe. So he was a post-production supervisor in LA and he also was like the face of Adobe and they would send him everywhere to kind of like help demo projects. And I was one of the only ones done in my class for some project and they were like, hey, anyone who's done can go down to the auditorium or whatever room it was and sit. And I went in there and I was like, I know this guy, I know this name. And he has a background in the skateboard stuff that I love from 20 years earlier. So nobody else in the audience had any idea who he was. <laughs> and I was losing my mind, but it's the same thing. I, afterwards, I like waited till every single person left. So I didn't have any competition. <laughs> and I was like, hey, like if I'm ever out in LA, can I pick your, can I shoot you an email? Can I pick your brain? Just you know, shoot you random questions. And he was super receptive. I got the job offer in LA, you know, through a different company, but immediately the second I got out to LA, I reached out to him and I said, hey, I'm here in LA, like, can I pick your brain? And I ended up working for him only four or five months later and worked for him for years. And he's, yeah, even after you leave that company, you know, only a few more years later, I left and he's still my, my kind of go-to where I'm like, whether it's project-based or just life, you know? Slightly different. I mean, I, I had very similar experiences, all these guys, as far as I just, I was pretty forthgoing with asking somebody if I, that I was really respected, I looked them up and this is when I was doing it, it was pre LinkedIn. So I had to, the stalking was a little harder back then. Um, but as you find it, it's some of the bigger companies, it's actually part of their just culture. So at Disney mentorships are just part of their culture. So when you start, they kind of pair you up and as you move throughout your career, the mentors kind of keep getting higher depending on your position, um, but they really strive, and I love this about it there, that you always kind of have a mentor who's ahead of you, who's always that kind of next step up to kind of keep giving you that advice. Um, even uh, when I was at ILM, as soon as I started that first week, that's the first thing they do is, in my case, they paired me up with another senior animator, um, and in this case, it was a guy who had worked on Return of the Jedi. Like, and I was like starstruck on day one. Um, but it was to help me navigate a new studio, a new experience. Because it all, you know, I know how to do my job, but it's all kind of new. And, uh, and these were all kind of personal things. And these are guys I didn't even expect would be my mentor. But here I am working with this guy, and he's helping me out and doing all this stuff. Um, yeah, it's, I, the other thing I'd add to that is just is, is never turn it down. If you see the opportunity there, like they've all said, don't be afraid to ask questions. 
I mean, Zach was amazing. Like when he was a student, he was here. He was consistently asking the right questions. And on our end, we can sense that. We yeah. know when that kid's got that ability to go to the next level, you're going to get more from us. And I think a key component to finding the mentor is, you know, for the mentoree to be doing the homework, you know. You know, don't just look at maybe a bio page or whatever. Do the homework, see what they've done. You know, try to look a little bit past what their professional uh, things they've done, you know. Uh, it definitely plays, plays a big role. Like if they, sh if they see that you've taken the time to kind of research them a little bit, then, um, you know, they're going to say, wow, this, this person's really done a little bit of homework, then maybe I'll give them a little more in-depth answer. Um, I think that's huge as well to, to play into that. Yeah, and I think it goes back to one, definitely clicking on past page one of Google, right? Like onto that second page right. to do that more unique research about that person too, to have those unique Never go to page three. No, yeah, it's page three, <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> but when you're working on those, it's kind of bringing it back to the beginning, right? When you're working on those passion projects while you're here as a student, going to your teachers, asking for feedback, for questions, you're developing all those skills. You're making uh, a mentorship mentor out of your teacher as well that will teach you the right questions to ask as well that when you move into the industry, you can continue to use all those skills. So they're all really connected. And on speaking about mentorship and questions, it is time to open the floor. And I think we have a few minutes that we can uh, take some questions from the audience. Uh, hi, I'm Joseph. I'm the game development program. I had uh, just a real quick question. Uh, a couple different times you guys mentioned stuff about taking your downtime to work on passion projects to further your skills. And I was just curious if do you feel that Full Sail prepped you with the skills that you would need for your industry? Just because I know at least for me personally, I find it difficult to find downtime because I currently have to work like 30, 40 plus hour work weeks just to even be here because I got to pay all my bills and stuff like that. My entire time at Full Sail, I only slept four, four hours a night for two years. And I was miserable at the end because I, I, I didn't know what was up or down. But that's how I push myself. I'm not, I mean, I don't necessarily condone a, a unhealthy lifestyle, but like you're so early in your career, you have the energy, capitalize on it. I think the other thing I would say is that um, the direct answer to your question is yes. I think that all of the programs you're going through, they are chosen and selected for very deliberate reasons. And that it is definitely a luxury for the people who have downtime to be able to do additional work. But I don't think that additional work is anything different than what you're doing in class. It's more about getting the reps. The more reps, the more practice you do, the better it's going to get, right? So, you know, for somebody with a packed schedule like you, I think just really capitalizing on the most, put trust into the system here. They do an excellent job picking the curriculum and know that the things they are telling you are the things you can learn or the things to learn and just like doubling down on your time in class. How can you pack more into the time that you're here? How can you like ask more questions during class uh, for the time that you do have to be here? And if you do that throughout your program, you'll, you'll get everything you need. Yeah, because it is one thing to think of like, you're here, like putting your time in the 30, 40 hours, but you're not being paid to be here. So you're paying to be here. So if you can get more out of your, you know, can I order more food off the same price kind of vibe, like pack it in now because it's, you know, you've already paid what you're, you know, to be here, take advantage, like make it 50 hours kind of thing. And in the same way, I don't necessarily condone an unhealthy lifestyle. And if anything, I try to push myself to say otherwise, <laughs> get sleep, right. get yeah. sleep, but yep. If you've got a weekend, take advantage of it. If you have spring break, take advantage of it. If you, you know, woke up early in the morning, go ahead and let's get out of bed and do those things. If class happens to end early, let's go to that studio or go spend time with the teacher. So that's that capitalizing. Great advice. Great. What other questions? We have a question in the front. Okay, in the front. <coughs> Hi, my name is Haley. I'm in computer animation, and I was just wondering, so like, after you graduate and you're like sending out your resumes, would you want to like m put things on there that like are similar to the studios you're going for, or do you want to like keep your stuff like as original as possible? Like, do you want it to be like I want to work for Disney, so do I do some things that are like geared towards Disney, or do I just show like my my own stuff? 
I mean, I guess I'll answer that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I ideally, if you have the time to do that, and, and say in your case, Disney's a Disney's the dream job, then absolutely. I mean, I we get thousands of reels um, from all walks, but ideally, at the end of the day, we are looking for certain fundamentals from a reel, and for us in particular, it is can they work within our style? And that's a really big thing with us because we might get some really good animation, but it's maybe it's just very creature heavy or something else that like, this would work great on ILM, might be tough for them to transition to a, to a cartoony style that we do here at the studio. Um, so I would say if that's your dream, start there because maybe even if you don't get picked up, that reel should still probably be at a very high caliber and there's chances are you'll probably get picked up by somebody else to allow you to keep working on your stuff to get you, to give you another shot to try to get back in. Like I always say, keep applying. Like never stop, like if that's your job, keep working on your stuff, keep applying, you know, literally year after year if that's where you wanna be. You know, that, that's my mentality on this stuff. Like to, uh, keep applying, keep applying. Thank you, huh? thank you. Um, I, I, w I would just add one really quick thing to that, which is that um, I think a really quick like analogy would be like if uh, a client came to a um, an ad agency and they got a project done, and then the next client came, that ad agency isn't generally going to take the exact same project file that they had before, swap out the assets, and like render it and deliver it because the narrative needs are different, the story is different for that client, right? The same thing applies to when you're communicating with companies, right? The, the, the blanket spray and pray resume approach isn't gonna be as effective as thinking about the companies that you wanna communicate with, thinking about what's important to them, what are they looking for in this role, what do I know about this company's style and the things that matter to them, and delivering your message to them within that context is gonna be much more effective than sort of spray and pray. Thank you. You should have a bunch of files on your desktop with your resume is what I'm collecting from this, right? Resumes I do for sure. Yeah, in real. I mean, once you've been out in the industry for a while, you'll start catering resume, or your reels mm -hmm. potentially yeah. to that when you have enough work. Mm -hmm. um, resumes though for a fact. Yeah. I have just for different studios, yeah. yeah. For sure. Thank you. Another question? Back here in the back, far right. Hi. My name is Fiorella Guanilo and I'm in the film production masters. My question is how do you guys find um like like how do you guys knew that what you guys are doing now is what you wanted to do for like the rest of your life? <laughs> like I recently graduated from the digital arts and design program and my mom encouraged me to like keep like doing my masters and I was like okay like I'm going to choose to do film production. It's like I'm doing like a little bit of everything. So how did you guys like end up where you are now? I, um, I think it's just a matter of what, what drives you. I mean, I, I came to school for a recording arts degree and I left working for a lighting company doing concert lighting and I now do video. And my career is like, has extreme ADHD tendencies to it. Um, <clears throat> but it's, and it's not a problem to change either. Um, you know, when I, came into the lighting world, it was, you know, lighting was kind of its own thing, but then um, media servers started to come into the picture and video started to get bigger and bigger. So as I saw that the industry was evolving and kind of changing, I started learning more and more about that, which involved to me changing into video. So, and I think the, at least in the touring world, and I definitely see in, in the, on the digital side, there's, there's so many aspects. I mean, for example, when I was here, digital media was one degree program. It covered everything. And look at how many degree programs because everything is getting more and more specialized. So you said something for the rest of your life, you know, just just be open and, you know, and watch watch how the industry changes. You know, um, your, your life may change and the industry may change and you may want to change with that. But for me, as far as choosing, um, you know, lighting really spoke to me. It was became fairly easy. Um, it made sense to me. Uh, mixing um, audio made no real sense to me. I kind of just, I think, I pushed and rotated some knobs till I graduated. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, it, I think it's just whatever really speaks to you will kind of lead you to that decision. Yeah, don't be afraid to change in the long run. 
I think it's you're going to grow and you're going to change. You're not who you were 10 years ago, and you're definitely not going to be who you are now in 20 years, and that's fine. And so, like, you know, be current, be present, and if you have a passion right now, there's nothing wrong with following it. And in 10, 15 years, you slowly start to have interest somewhere else. That's okay. I literally did that. I did 12 years of commercial animation and visual effects in Los Angeles, and then I moved to San Francisco and entered the tech industry six years ago. So it, what matters is understanding what's important to you. You know, for me, it's like I'm a maker. Uh, I want to be, I'm a storyteller and a maker, and it's like there's a lot of different ways I can do that. And if you, if you, if you existentially identify yourself too specifically, uh, you sort of lose the flexibility of changing with the times. Yeah, I still have no idea what I want to do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think that's also what drives me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a constant reminder, because I always see somebody who's doing something cooler than I'm doing, or at least I view it that way, right? Um, but that's motivation to me, to just keep trying to move up somewhere. I, I don't know where that's at yet, and I'll let you know in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think, too, we're all kind of following the fun. I think that's been a yeah. theme. You've mentioned that word a lot, too, Colin. You know, so I think we following, and the fun is the passion, right? That's the thing that makes us excited. So I do want to thank you all for being here today. We've taken all the questions, and I want to encourage all of you, and this is this idea going back to our theme of kind of tapping into that extra component we can do. Before you leave, or maybe at night when you're reflecting about today, write down some action items. What are the things that you're going to continue to do to prepare for graduation? There's been a lot of little gems that have been given to all of you today and to those who are watching this online. So go ahead and make note of what, what you're going to do. Put them someplace you're going to see every day. Sorry, this is my educator heart talking. But these are the things that make the difference. And I think they would all agree with that as well. So thank you all for being here. You're an excellent group. And enjoy Hall of Fame. Be involved. Yeah.